This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Today, we're getting ready to venture out on the mighty Mississippi River with the owner and operator of Blue Cat Guide Service, Bob Crosby. With a wealth of knowledge and expertise to match, Bob fishes the deep holes, deep channels, ledges, and drop-offs for big blues. Some of the things we hope to talk about throughout the hour, what types of lures attract the best catches, how to stay safe on the water, and what areas make for the best catches. Also, Dr. Major will be ready for your pet questions, and Libby and the rest of us always like to hear about your encounters with nature. You can email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. And if you miss the Creature Comforts broadcasts on Thursday, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning. Uh, Libby, let's start with you. I think you've got a couple announcements you wanted to share. Uh, yes, I wanted to remind people, as I reminded you and myself <laughs> this morning, uh, March the 4th, so coming up quick, is the Fossil Road Show. So mm. remember that and... Um, Round up your unidentified objects if you've got a shoebox full or if you just got a couple of prized possessions that you've wondered what they were. If you think they might be a fossil or um, archaeological piece or an interesting rock, you can take them to the Natural Science Museum on March the 4th and find out what they are and what they were maybe in life. And um, I like to look back at my calendar and see... um, what I've seen in years past to kind of uh, figure out what I'm going to look for. And uh, this week, last year, we saw our first orange-tipped sulfur butterfly and our first pearly crescent butterfly. So those are a couple of things I'll be hunting for between rainstorms, I think. I started to go out yesterday afternoon uh, just as it started raining, so I didn't get a chance to, to find any great treasures. And we found stink horn mushrooms. You remember the weird um, mushrooms that we found that time? Mm-hmm. So the, that was a year ago, so I'll be looking for them. I um, made a quick list this morning of birds I was hearing, and they're, um, even though I, I like to say it's spring is coming, but the bird population in my yard is still pretty much my winter birds. I heard cardinals and yellow-rumped warblers and uh, American robin, tufted titmouse, uh, let's see, a crow, um, and still had a golden-crowned kinglet and white-throated sparrow. And those are things that as spring gets closer, they will leave. And also the chickadees, they... To me, now maybe it's just me being more aware, but this time of year they're, um, they start a pretty song in the morning. So I think maybe they are getting ready for spring. And they'll, of course, they're a year-round resident. So most of these birds that I heard this morning are the yellow rump warblers will leave and the white-throated sparrow and the um, kinglets. And the rest will stay here and nest. Uh, You did mention the weather, so uh, throughout the day, different parts of the state will be under the gun for some severe weather. So uh, the phrase I think they're using these days is just stay weather aware. Your usual uh, sources for information when bad weather comes, just say you're close to that. And obviously we want everybody to do what's best for them to stay safe if severe weather does threaten in your particular part of the state. We've got uh, Dr. Major on the line as usual from his clinic. Good morning, Dr. Major. Got a couple of emails here for you. This first one says, I'm thinking of adopting a two-year-old border collie male that's never been neutered. He has a high temperament according to his present owner, and I'm wondering what the possible effect on him would be if we neuter him. Would it have a negative effect on him? So how old again? Uh, Two years old. And the breed? The uh, border collie male. Okay, okay. I just kind of mixed it. I had a dog barking in the background <laughs> and didn't, under, didn't understand exactly. Uh, and they're concerned about? Uh, it says high temperament, according to the present owner, and they're wondering what possible effect neutering would have on that. 
It's variable. I can't tell you absolutely, but it probably will help calm calm this dog slump if that's what they're asking. Mm -hmm. In other words, if it was a high temperament, uh, it doesn't always work like that. We have neuter dogs that are very high strung, this sort of thing. So I would say yes and see if the neutering helps, but they may also need some help with a trainer if this dog is, is giving them a problem. So I would say yes to, in answer to the neuter, okay? And is there ever a, a time when a, a, a cat or a dog is too old to be spayed or neutered? A lot of that depends on the animal itself. We see a fair amount of, for example, in females, we see a fair amount of pyometra, which is infected uterus. Uh, they're going to continue to cycle uh, over and over again. Uh, every six months usually, and this can cause some issues from the standpoint of uh, infected uterus. Uh, we see that fairly fairly often. Uh, cats, <clears throat> of course, cats, one of the things with cats, female cats, they are seasonally, polyesters, I guess is the right word, but they come in the season, and you may be aware of this, usually every two or three weeks, uh, until they're pregnant or until they're spayed. So that gets to be an issue, especially if uh, they're outside, they're going to get pregnant. Uh, inside, it may cause some disturbances. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> if you've ever heard uh, a cat in, in, in season, caterwauling, I guess, is the right word. All right. Males, as far as males, Personally, on all of these, I like to wait a little bit longer, say six months to a year if you can. Uh, cats, male cats, if they start spraying or before they start spraying, which is usually about six months, which is basically atomized urine, it can be quite pungent, and I recommend neutering the male cats somewhere around six months. All righty. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is an interesting uh, situation. It says, I have a poodle who I've adopted and her teeth are rotten. It leaves a smell where she stinks. How do you get rid of the smell? Also, she's really afraid of humans, always runs from them and shakes when she's picked up. How can we help her not to be afraid? Gosh. Well, she may be in pain. If the teeth are rotten, they need to consult with her veterinarian about that because uh, it's, it's going to get worse and it can cause... Uh, a lot of things. It can cause uh, heart, kidney. Uh, you can get the bacteria in the bloodstream, so it can affect the whole body. This actually is National uh, Pet Dental Month, so be aware. Uh, I'm sure that most of the veterinarians are promoting that. But I'd say a large percentage of our dogs and cats that we see, when I say a large percentage, probably 40 50 percent, are in need of dental care. Uh, this particular animal probably needs to be on antibiotics. I'm not the being afraid of people and everything. That may be a serious problem in an older dog. The dog is uh, very difficult to correct that problem. But uh, usually, if you can associate the dog and introduce it to various people, it does help. If, you, if that will help. Uh, and as we we did talk about pent dental health month a couple of weeks ago, and you were saying important to try to start early on that. Obviously, if you uh, make sure you're getting that annual checkup at least, so that uh, your vet can check your pet's teeth uh, once a year when he comes in for that annual checkup. But uh, stay on top of it, I guess, before things get too bad, because as you mentioned, that it, it can have some very serious side effects. How how old is this dog? Does the email it, it, email about? No, it doesn't mention it in the email. So. Okay. Usually, if it if it's really it truly has, excuse me, truly has rotten teeth, uh, it's got some age on it. I would suspect probably eight eight years plus, but that's not necessarily true. But it uh, it is in need of some help from the standpoint of your veterinarian, and uh, probably antibiotics and dental care, possibly pull those teeth that are rotten. Obviously. Okay, let's get one more in before our first break, and this one says. I have an eight-year-old Pomeranian that's a large one, and he lives inside. He seems to cough for long periods of time and acts like he's going to throw up. Someone said they thought it was kennel cough, but he's never spent time boarded. 
I've been giving him Benadryl tablets. They seem to help a bit, but please advise on what I might do to help him. We've seen quite a bit of uh, pharyngitis in dogs that probably is not related to kennel cough. Uh, I would say that if this dog is doing this consistently, you need to have it checked out. And there could be other reasons uh, other than pharyngitis. It could be related to heart, uh, lung issues causing that. Most of the dogs that we're seeing that have the pharyngitis type thing are coughing up white foam or phlegm. And a lot of these dogs have not been around other dogs, so it's difficult to explain how it might have picked that up. It may not be a contagious deal. It may be more due to conditions, weather conditions. Uh, even on the inside dogs, we see some of the, uh, the same things that we would see in an outside dog. All right, this is Creature Comforts. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. Our guest in studio today is Bob Crosby. He's the owner and operator of Blue Cat Guide Service, and we're going to be talking about catfish of the state today. You can join our conversation with your question or comment. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. So if you have a question for Bob about catfish or a pet question for Dr. Major, he stays on the line throughout the program. So give us a call. Be involved in the show today. We'd love to hear from you. So before the break, we wanted to test your creature knowledge and ask if you could name the official state fish of Mississippi. And our hint was it was not the catfish. I'll open this up to our guests here in studio. Anybody want to guess on what the, the state fish is? Go, I'm, Libby. I know it, so I think I should wait and see if anybody <laughs> else wants to. Yeah, I was at the museum when we made that, the state uh-huh. fish. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, go ahead. Tell we did us. a bunch of them. Now, I guess it's still the largemouth bass, it right? It is indeed yeah. the largemouth bass, yes. So uh, do we remember why the, that was chosen? Uh, we had a group of, of children involved with it. You know, the, most of the early ones, the magnolia and the mockingbird, there were school children. Miss Cook did those, and the school children were involved. And after finding those records and realizing, and we thought it would be fun to do, so we did several. Um, I'm trying to think now what all we did there together. But we uh, we did the land mammal, the... Um, uh, white-tailed deer and uh, the um, bottlenose dolphin for the water mammal and several of them. And we got kids had to learn about, had summer camps, and they would learn about, you know, like a whole list of animals. And then they all voted and decided which one they wanted to be the symbol. Libby, talk if you could, um, I'm, I hate to put you on the spot, but talk a little bit about the bottlenose dolphin because I think a lot of people wouldn't think about that animal when it comes to, you know, Mississippi wildlife. Oh, yeah, I guess so, especially if you don't live on the coast. You may not think as much about that wildlife that lives in the water is just as much a part of wildlife. Bob, he specializes, I think, in the freshwater stuff, but on um, those things that live in the salt water. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's not my expertise. Uh, yeah, I'm not really familiar with your bottlenose dolphin. Bottlenose dolphin, yeah. yeah. Well, um, they, uh, they're pretty plentiful on the coast, although the numbers have fallen and people are concerned. It's, you know, almost everything that lives in the ocean, people have some fears about. We thought we had done the, all the Save the Whales stuff back in the 70s, and many species of whales are imperiled again. And uh, dolphins are in that same group of animals, so they can be considered small whales. And, um, you know, they have the reputation of being friendly, and I've always seen that to be true in my life. And uh, they're just great little things to have out there. It's hard to imagine going sailing on the Gulf and not seeing bottlenose dolphins. So. I think you could maybe stump somebody with Final Jeopardy about that. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. uh, you know, what is Mississippi's water, water official water mammal? Water you know? mammal, yeah, that's it. Libby, I've got a question. Okay. People are always asking me on the river about the sharks coming up the river, and I've never seen one. Is that Something yes. that actually happens? There are some, and I, I can't remember. I want to say it's bull shark, that actually there is a, a, you know, a good solid museum specimen record of one coming all the way up to Memphis. Mm. So, you know, depending on how fresh the water is in the river and how salty it is, I guess once they get started going north and there's kind of a saltwater intrusion down there on the coast, I guess this guy just kept going they just kept going yeah huh? i don't know if he became unhealthy and that's why he uh 
hmm. was captured or or what happened. But anyway, there was a shark that, that well, made it all, almost to Memphis, and hmm. I think it was a bull shark, but I could be wrong on that. Yeah, I'll keep my eyes open, but so far I haven't seen <laughs> one. Yeah, if you catch a, a, a big shark, that's going to really make the news. Yeah. I don't know if that would help your guiding business or uh, not, though. It might scare people off. <laughs> yeah. uh, that might not be a good thing. Yeah. So, Dr. Major, you have any stories of uh, sharks in freshwater and in, in rivers? <laughs> yes, in a way, yes. You know, and uh, you know that I've, for years, had gone to Nicaragua doing uh, work there for mm-hmm. animals and everything. And the uh, sharks in Lake Nicaragua actually were bull sharks, and they migrated up the river, and they were actually an indigenous population there in the, the lake there at uh, Granada. So uh, all I can say is that it's a large lake, and when after the revolution, Chinese uh, fishermen pretty much fished out all the uh, uh, bull sharks that were in that lake, and uh, there may be a few coming back up now, but uh, they kind of removed the sharks from the lake for the fins. They were doing the fins for, for their soup. Mm-hmm. So anyway, yeah, and I I read a report not a long time ago. I can't verify this, but actually, a bull shark had made it almost to Kansas City. So wow. you know, I, I went up the Mississippi River further. I just pulled and, this up too. Yeah, and it looks like and they, they are bull sharks. And uh, one was just uh, there at um, St. Louis, and one yeah. let's see, one in Alton, Illinois, wow. and another at St. Louis. So they've gone further than Memphis now. That, we, the, used to, uh-huh. we, used to, we used to have a, uh, what shall I say, it was, I believe it was a shark uh, from the reservoir uh, mounted out there. What's the Dutch bar and grill? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can really trust the, yeah, the scientific information you learn in the Dutch bar, yeah. That's, right. Yeah. That, was, that was back in the old days. That was a long time yeah. ago. But uh, I would say that... Uh, Yes, they can. Uh, they can survive quite well uh, in, in fresh water if they're going to stay in Lake Nicaragua because it is all fresh. And uh, uh, for years, they thought that maybe you know, in the development of Lake Nicaragua, that an earthquake or whatever, and they come from the uh, from the ocean. But actually, they traveled up the river and uh, had an indigenous population there. I, you know, there was a Mark Twain. A uh, story once about I think he went to ne- Lake Nicaragua. You know when they were doing that torturous <laughs> way to get across the peninsula before the Panama Canal. But well, I don't well, know that he mentioned any it, bull sharks. That would be I'm well, have they, to go back and look. That, huh? No, that's one of the ways that they defeated that program. If you read the history books about the sharks and all the dangers, but uh, that was one thing. And of course, that was a, back just like today. It's all political. It actually would have been much less expensive to go through Lake Nicaragua instead of making the Panama Canal, but uh, that's neither here nor there. That's past history. There is a, gosh, the Chinese had a program where they were going to build a new canal uh, through Nicaragua down the river into the Caribbean, you know, starting the Pacific. It's only about Gosh, it narrows point before you get to the Pacific Ocean from Lake Nicaragua, probably less than 90 miles. And then they would have gone through the lake and on down that river that uh, drains from the lake into the Caribbean. Well, Doc, did they have catfish in that lake? Gosh, that's a great question. I do not know that. Uh, well, I might, I, need, I might need to go check that out. <laughs> well, they have they have the they have the in, in lots of the rivers there. They have what's called the rainbow bass, which is a pretty good sized fish. Um, I have eaten fish from Lake Nicaragua, and usually they serve them, you know, with head on, eyes looking at you, this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it, I'm fine uh, with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem. They were good fish. It yeah. tasted good. And some of the best ceviche uh, that you've ever walked uh, down, in, down in Nicaragua. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Our guest today, Bob Crosby. He's owner and operator of Blue Cat Guide Service and catcher of big, big cats from the Mississippi River. 
Uh, so, Bob, tell us, how did you get interested in, in catching the big catfish? Uh, well, it's a long story. Uh, a friend and I were just looking for an adventure one time. This was about, shoot, 20, 25 years ago. So we went over to the Mississippi River and we spent the day on the river. And it was such a neat experience, uh, we just kept going back. And uh, the second time we went back, we, of course, we took our fishing tackle. And uh, it's just kind of trial and error. Over a period of years, we kind of learned how to fish the river. It's a different animal than the lakes and streams, but uh, it's just a special place. You know, There's uh, the Mississippi River is known for the biggest catfish in North America, and the lower Mississippi is known as the best portion. So I mean, right here in our backyard in Vicksburg, we've got just a phenomenal fishing resource, and it's just not utilized that much. All right, so when we talk about big catfish, how big are we talking about? Oh, shoot. Uh, the state record is actually, I think, around 131 pounds. Wow. That's a monster. But we've caught uh, fish up to 90 pounds, and uh, we catch 40s and 50s regularly. Uh, we've caught 60s, and the other day we caught up an 80. Hmm. So there's, there's some big fish over there. Uh, tell us about a project uh, that you were involved with uh, tagging the big catfish uh, for the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. What's the process there, and is it Right, uh, right. We're excited about that. Uh, I'm participating in that. I've got a friend uh, that lives in Hernando. He guides uh, David Magnus south of Memphis, that area, uh, catting around guide service. And uh, the Department of Wildlife is trying to monitor the movements and the habitats of the big fish. So we're tagging anything 20 pounds plus. And uh, we've tagged, we've been tagging about two years now, and we've tagged over 200 fish. And uh, we've had, uh, we, we tag them with two tags. Uh, each tag has a Department of Wildlife's phone number and a tag number. And once a month, David and I have to re send reports in on what we've tagged, and so they have a record of it. And if anybody calls in and reports it, but so far, we've had four fish recaught and, uh, and reported in. And one of the most unusual fish was David caught one south of Memphis. Five months later, someone caught it at St. Louis. Hmm. That fish swam almost 500 river miles in five months. Wow. And uh, I've had one caught uh, at Port Gibson. I caught it between Vicksburg and Port Gibson, and a friend down there actually caught it, Jimmy Cassell, and about six months later, but that fish had probably not moved 100 yards. He what? just was, <laughs> he was a homebody. So. And uh, it's worked. Also, you know, we can tell how much they gained when we catch them. We document the length, the weight, and when somebody calls in, we can tell how much weight they gained. So that fish that I caught and that, that Jimmy recaught, I think in, what was it, five, six months, it gained four pounds. So David fish up there that swam 500 miles, it only gained one pound. But he was swimming <laughs> up river. But you're right. that You obviously caught the homebody fish yeah. there. He was on the couch that whole time. <laughs> you know, we talk about when in science, whenever you answer one question with some research, it generally opens up 10 more. Yeah. And think of all these questions. Now, why would one fish sit there for five months and the other? I mean, that was pretty much constant northern motion up to river. make it yeah. 500. Yeah, yeah. upriver. Yeah. Creature Comforts, Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. Our guest today is Bob Crosby from Blue Cat Guide. We're talking about catfish fishing for the big catfish on the Mississippi River. You can join our conversation with your question or comment today. Email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. More catfish talk in just a minute, but we do have a caller on the line, so let's say good morning to Raylani, who calls us from Hattiesburg. Good morning. You're on the air. Go ahead. Good morning. I have a question as to how the alligator gar came into being. I caught one from uh, a pier off the coast. He was at least 500 feet. I mean 500 feet. He was five feet long and so heavy that I couldn't get my hook, and I just had to walk all the way to the beach to try to get my hook. And they have this, these human-like eyes. They just look up at you. I mean, if you move one way or another, they're going to be looking at you. 
Uh, so is there anything genetically that maybe an alligator and a bar got together, or what is the story? Okay, uh, they are not related at all to alligators, the the reptile alligators. So yeah, the alligator gar is a different animal entirely, but they are very interesting historically. When you said how did they come to be, I don't know how they came to be originally, but I know that it happened a long time ago. They are in the fossil records when dinosaurs were walking on the earth. And, you know, we uh-huh. know they walked here in Mississippi. We found enough evidence for that. Yeah. All right, that's what was in the water, alligator gar and paddlefish. Yeah. The the fossil record shows that they're as old and have been, you know, were in existence when dinosaurs were. And, of course, we know what happened to the dinosaurs, huh? or at least to some extent. We know they're not here anymore, <laughs> except yeah. in the form of birds. Birds pretty much uh-huh. came from dinosaurs. But um, the alligator gar remains relatively unchanged changed for all these mm. I guess you know hundreds of millions of years so they're yeah. really of interest sturgeon alligator gar and and really I guess not just the alligator gar probably, maybe the other species of gar I will have to do another show on that right mm-hmm. but but gar and paddlefish and sturgeon are all considered ancient fish and they were they are they're as, as ancient as some of the dinosaurs Wow, well, thank you. Yeah. Right. I appreciate that. Thanks but for the they, uh, I let mine go. Someone wanted to hit it in the head. Somebody wanted to shoot it. I said, no, 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 no. Let's, let's figure out a way to let this poor fish. I guess you call them fish. Yeah, are they, they fish? are They are fish. They are definitely fish, and I think you did the right thing letting it go, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. We caught two that day. It, um, it was during the time the Mississippi River gates or locks or something had been open and a lot of muddy water was coming into the Gulf. Thank you very much. I love your show. All Thank right. you for calling. Thanks, Raylani. If you want to join our conversation, give us a call. We've got some open phone lines at one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. We're visiting this hour on Creature Comforts with Bob Crosby, owner and operator of Blue Cat Guide Service. He works the Mississippi River looking for the big, big catfish. Uh, Bob, do we know why um, the Mississippi River has these big fish? Well, I think it's because it's such a big body of water, uh, and it doesn't get that much fishing pressure. I mean, you go over there, um, the boat ramps may be 50, 60 miles apart, so there's some stretches of the river that actually never get fished. Uh, These big fish, uh, a 50-pound fish, I'm told it's probably 20 years old, so it takes a long time to grow a big fish like that. And our lakes and streams get so much fishing pressure, I don't think they get time to grow that old. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, the river is such a big body of water, uh, not that much fishing pressure, so they just, and there's a, a good food source in the river. I mean, they got a lot of uh, choices of food. The river floods, they get into the backwater, the tributaries, so they've got a good food source. and. Uh, just time to grow old and get big. So um, do you take just folks that are looking to fish, or do you sometimes take out people that just want an adventure on the river? Oh, I usually fishing. I, I love to fish. I've taken a couple of people out that just wanted to ride up and down the river and sightsee, and uh, it was boring as heck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fisherman. Uh so, no, I, I, most, I say 99% of my trips are fishing trips. All right. Uh, when you take folks on the Mississippi, what are some things uh, they keep in mind about being safe? Oh, the first thing, we always wear a life jacket. We never take our life jacket off. And uh, you need a big, comfortable boat. Uh, you know, the water can get rough out there, but uh, if you're careful, if you know the river, it scares people, but it's... You don't need to be intimidated. If you can go out with somebody one or two times and kind of learn the river, avoid the uh, big tugboats. Uh, you know, they make big waves. Uh, the first boat my friend and I fished in over there was just like a 18-foot small boat with a like a 40-horsepower motor on it. And when those big tugboats would come by, we'd just go to the bank and let the, let the uh, rolls, barge rolls die down. But the boat I've got now is big enough. We can just, uh, you know, we don't get close to the barges, but, you know, we can handle the waves easily. But 
uh, just a good sized bass boat, or uh, you shouldn't have any trouble. So um, you talked about how big these are, and I'm imagine that's kind of um, the allure is that this is man versus beast kind of thing. But it sounds like it's physically straining to try to land one of these things. Oh yeah, it's it's just a thrill. I mean, everybody usually that fishes with me have caught catfish, but a trophy is different to different people. Some some people a five pound catfish is you know a trophy. The other people they're not satisfied unless they catch a fifty pound. But uh, you know, typically where we're fished, there's no logs or stumps like you see in the local lake. So you get a big one on, you just let him run around and tire. But uh, those 40, 50 pound catfish, it usually takes us about thirty minutes to get it in. Uh, what about uh, bait and lures? What's uh, what's the suggestion there? Oh, we use uh, you know catfish or uh, well, they call scavengers. I hate to call them scavengers, but uh, our main bait, primary baits are shad and skipjack. And they're both native to the river. We catch them in the river or catch them at uh, the lakes and take them over there. But uh, we cut them up size, about the size of a golf ball or tennis ball. And uh, they're the real smelly bait fish. So when we come back, uh, not only does the bait smell, but um, our clothes smell. So it's <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I think I could tear my shirt into rags and put it on the hook and catch fish. But uh, uh, it's a real smelly bait, and it, it does attract the fish. Uh, what are some places? I mean, I, I know fishermen are very you know guarded of their of their places when they find a lot of fish. But in general, kind of are there parts of the river that are better than others for fish? Uh, yeah, primarily you need a good. Uh, Depth finder, good electronics, and how to use it. It's such again such a big body of water. If you just go out there and drop a hook somewhere, the chances of catching a fish are pretty small. But what we do, we there's two methods we fish. When the water's warm, we do what we call this bottom bouncing. It's kind of drifting down the river, uh, kind of like bass fishing for catfish. Uh, in the winter, when it gets cold, you know the fish are lethargic and they won't chase the bait, so we anchor over these deep holes. So we go over the holes with our depth finder and try to locate fish. And if we see fish, we'll anchor over them, uh, put out six or eight of our B&M rods. And uh, if we get a bite, we'll stay there. If not, we give it 30 minutes, we go somewhere else. We're just hitting holes till we find find the fish and find active fish. But uh, yeah, usually they congregate in those deep holes over there, anywhere from 40 to We've caught fish down to about 115 feet before. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Major, you have any experience fishing for big catfish? No, I haven't. Uh, certainly uh, look forward to sometime in the near future to, to go out and see what we can do. I, I think it would be great. And uh, just being outdoors, certainly I, I would rather do some fishing rather than just sightseeing, but you know, going along the midst of the river is certainly uh, uh, a thrill for most people. Yeah. One thing we've it's encouraging over there, uh, in the past we saw very few bald eagles. But lately we've been seeing a lot of bald eagles. I think that would interest people. Sometimes we actually see two a day. So that, that's very encouraging about the habitat, I guess, improvement, Libby. Yeah, we're doing seeing the same. Almost every trip we'll see an eagle. Yeah. And we've, you know, learned a couple of places where we're more likely to see them, so mm-hmm. we watch out. But, yeah, that is very encouraging. You're right. Some things can adapt to human presence more than others, and those are, of course, the things that we have more of right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Bob, we talked a little bit about your work with uh, wildlife fisheries and parks at the tagging, so that's kind of a catch-and-release program. But uh, are these big catfish good to eat? They are, but uh, it's kind of if people fish off the Mississippi coast, uh, you know, the, I compare it to redfish. Those big bull reds aren't considered that good to eat. Uh, the small eating-sized fish are great catfish, but and I think it's a shame to kill something that old. So anything over... 30 pounds, I encourage people to release them. You know, again, it's a sh- just a shame to kill something that old. Let it live and uh, let somebody else catch it later. And, you know, the, right now the Fish and Wildlife Service really encourages people to not eat big fish because they bioaccumulate mercury. And um, hopefully hmm. there's now less mercury in the river than there was 20 years ago. But these fish were 
growing up 20 years ago. Yeah. So it, they say, I think, about 15 pounds. It's best to eat a fish that's smaller, I, I, I think, I haven't heard 15. that, Libby. I, I'd like to know. Yeah, well, that's what – that's, and I know that's the advice that Paul gives is it's hmm. just – a safer, especially if you're going to eat it very often. Mm-hmm. And it might not hurt anybody to eat a, a big catfish mm. once or twice, but um, if you're going to be fishing often, make a habit of And now that doesn't apply to saltwater fish yeah. or to many other big fish, but catfish do tend to eat on the bottom and buy yeah, well, it looks like it may have affected Paul some. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, yeah. think he may have eaten. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Bob, is there a better time of day to go fishing? Uh, not really, Kevin. I think, uh, you know, we're fishing such deep water. Um, it's just when you find the fish. It's not like uh, you're bass fishing where you need to be out there at daylight. Uh, it's just whenever you find the right location, I think. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. Our guest today is Bob Crosby from Blue Cat Guide. Uh, still time to join a conversation. Uh, got a number of calls to get to, so let's start again on the phone lines with Jim from Jackson. Jim, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Good morning. When you fish in the Mississippi River, do you need a Mississippi or a Louisiana fishing license? Uh, from what I understand, either one. You know, Louisiana on one side, of course, and Mississippi on the other side. So uh, either one, either license is legal, I'm I'm told. Yeah, I guess I should get the cheaper one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll vote for the Mississippi one. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we need your, your license. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I get a lot of people from out of state, and you can get a one- or two-day non-resident fishing license for, shoot, just 6 or eight, ten dollars $10. It's not very much. Yeah, and the pro- usually, though, you're going to get the best price on wherever you have your driver's license. Yeah. Okay. All right, Jim, thanks for calling in this morning. Let's uh, stay on the phone lines. Next, it's off to Eupora. Our friend Rachel has called in today. Good morning, Rachel. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, Back in the 70s, I lived beside the little Biloxi River down on the coast, and uh, I uh, took these two guard that were about the length of your index finger uh, that I found in the river and put them in an aquarium. And I uh, enjoyed them for a while, for several months. And one day I put a piece of pretty driftwood into the water, and it made them uh, go blind. And uh, I just wanted to tell that story in case somebody ever decides to put some driftwood in their aquarium. All right. You know, um, Rachel, we've learned at the museum that um, having – Almost any fish in in bright sunlight for very long can make them go blind. Hmm. Do you think that could have, or maybe there was a chemical on your your piece of wood? I guess, but it it, it might be likely that somehow they got too much sun. Uh, they were not in the sun. They weren't. In the I sun. had them in the house, in my kitchen. Now I think there was, there might have been a fluorescent light over them. Uh, but this happened within minutes of the time I put the wow. driftwood in there. Wow, there was something on yeah. the driftwood. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Uh-huh. You know, we've kept those small gar in the museum, and I just think they are beautiful aquarium fish. Oh, I do too. Yeah. I do too. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, put that out there. I could be wrong. But Thanks it for the happen. warning. Sure, And, sure. you know, I think in general, be careful of anything you put in with your fish in the aquarium. I yeah. guess so. Yeah. All right, uh, yeah. Rachel, thanks for calling in today. Let's uh, move on next. Do that. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Tim on the line from Brandon. Good morning, Tim. Go ahead. Good morning, sir. I was wanting to comment on the last uh, uh, conversation about eating uh, big catfish that are not good to eat. But what I experienced is, uh, I'm from Brandon, and I fished the Ross Barnett Reservoir uh, quite often, and I recently started jug fishing, and I catch bigger fish. And I find that cutting the red layer of, of uh, fat off the top and just leaving the whiter portion makes the fish a little more palatable. They're not quite as oily if you, uh, if, if you clean them like that. Uh, okay, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. I know that's true when we eat the um, those uh, carp, the Asian carp. Mm-hmm. 
because my husband's been determined that we're never we're never putting one of those back in. If it jumps in the boat, we either eat it or uh, dispose of it because they are not you know they're not good for our environment. They're well, do you have a special recipe for those? Yeah, he does have a few. Yeah, but and, and now to our caller, um, how do you fix your catfish? Do you fry it or? I usually fry it. Occasionally, I, I will uh, uh, bake it. I blacken it. Yeah. All right, uh, Tim. Thanks for calling in today. Uh, let's go next to Mike, who's in Hernando. And Doctor Major, looks like we might have a pet question here for you. Mike, what do you have for us? Well, I'll change the the rule. I do have a pet question, and I need help. Okay. Uh, I've got a male cat who is now two years old who is marking the house, countertops, tabletops, um, bathtub, everywhere. I come home some night and even on the uh, bath on the kitchen floor, there's a puddle. Uh, he's not neutered, and is there anything I can do to stop this? Other, uh, you know, obviously neutering him, but I don't know why he's marking the house just constantly. Several things could be uh, play in play here. Number one, he could have an infection. I mean, that's possible. Uh, really, to have peace in the house, you really need to have that cat neutered. It may be too late. He may still mark some. That can be a problem. Uh, uh-huh. There are some things that you can think about. There's uh, a spray and a diffuser that you can put into your uh, uh you know, electrical plug, uh, what's called fell away. Uh, that what's it called? Uh, repeat that. F F E L I W A Y fell away, and you okay. can look that up and see. And that may help, but definitely I would suggest having him neutered and having him checked. I doubt if he's got a UTI, but he might, and that may be an issue there. Uh, uh-huh. I wish you luck, but it, it really gets to be a, a, a problem. There are some medications that your veterinarian might recommend to give, but most of those have to be given every day, uh, maybe even right. twice a day. So I would go ahead and. Well, I did. I, I did speak to. I did speak to my vet, and he just said, "Get him neutered." So I, I know where you're coming from. And I, at about Alrighty. six months, again, six months is about the ideal age before they start spraying. But good luck to you. All right, thank you. All right, Mike. Appreciate your phone call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio, visiting today with Bob Crosby from Blue Cat Guide. Uh, we've been talking about fishing for big catfish on the river. And, Bob, we mentioned it, I think, but this is something you could do year-round. You just change your strategy a little bit depending on the season. Oh, sure. We fish year-round. Um, actually, this is the best time of the year. People don't realize it. I know other species of fish, uh, bass, brim, crappie, it's usually the spring but the catfish usually, like I said, when the water gets cold, they congregate in those deep holes. So uh, this is actually the best time of year. We just bundle up, put a lot of clothes on, and go fishing. All right. We got about a minute or so left. Do you have a quick uh, catfish story for us? Oh, I've got had one trip recently. It was kind of unique. I had three guys, and uh, we fished and fished and fished. And by 11 o'clock, we hadn't caught a fish. We were all getting discouraged. And I told him, said, don't give up, don't give up. So we went to another place, uh, put out our B&M rods, and all of a sudden, three rods went down. We had three big fish on at one time. <laughs> we actually got them in. Usually you get several fish on like that, you lose one or both of them. But we actually got them in. We had, a, I think, a 40-something, a 30-something, and a 20-something. So everybody was happy. We had a good day. And the, the lesson there is, as you said, be patient, don't give up, keep at it. That's my motto, <laughs> don't ever give up. All right, so Bob, if someone was listening this morning and wants to know more about Blue Cat Guide and, and you and maybe uh, request your service, how can they get in touch? Uh, my website is bluecatguideservice.com. Okay. And uh, I just love discussing catfishing. So, I mean, if you just want to talk catfishing, give me a call. Information's on the website. All right, very good. I always like to remind you that uh, if you're ever out and about uh, in nature and you see something that you think is interesting or you don't know exactly what it is, if you have your smartphone with you, go ahead and snap a picture of it and send it to animals at mpbonline.org. Libby has a vast network of people that she can uh, consult with if she's stumped as well. But it's, I think it's a lot of fun when we get uh, you know pictures and things to try to help you identify what exactly it is that you're seeing. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcast 
Broadcasting Think Radio, and funding is provided in part by listeners. To hear today's show or a previous show, you can visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Media app, then you get to listen to all the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. Our show is produced by Java Chapman. Our call screener today was Jason Klein, and our podcast producer is Jermaine Flood. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Bob Crosby, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to stay tuned because up next, it's AutoCorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android